oh, I see better color, I see more activity, my fish breed. I have a full line pet store. I have fish tanks where I have epistogrammas breeding. Uh, I carry the big size in my store because my customers love this stuff. Hi everybody, John here with another FinCast and I'm at the Global Pet Expo in Orlando 2017. Got a real treat for you today. Uh, Mike Tushinardi is here and Mike travels the world for Coral Magazine and Amazonas Magazine. He's been featured in many of my FinCasts before and he was actually the inspiration for my current tannin tank that we've been talking about. Mike is the guy that was snorkeling down in the Rio Negro River, which was fun, right? It was incredible, absolutely, yeah. That was an unbelievable experience. So we saw, we saw Mike's video and I said, well, okay, I've got to do this. I've got to set up an aquarium and I saw some pictures of his. So Mike, you have kind of led me down this path now through tannin aquatics and whatnot. And I've got all this junk in the bottom of my tank and, uh, and I'm loving it. Uh, is this something that's really growing in the hobby? You know, it is. And um, I was a little hesitant at first. I didn't think this would have so much of a broad appeal, but I think people really are interested in seeing how to make it a freshwater aquarium more of a natural setup more like actual habitat so you know it's it's pretty cool to see um tan and aquatics is is growing the hobby in that way and you know i try and provide a little inspiration with my underwater pictures and and my travels to these areas but man it's it's taking off you know what is it you think that appeals uh, uh to people about this well i think it's something for crazy fish nerds for sure um you know it's not necessarily that the new hobby is going to jump right into this but I think when you have a tank that really replicates the fish's environment, it becomes more than just a fish tank because the fish are doing what they would do in the wild in your tank. They're ruffling through the leaf litter. They're, they're you know, displaying the colors that they would in the wild. That sort of thing, it goes beyond just having an aquarium in your house and looking at fish. It's, it's like transporting you to the Rio Negro or to the Atabapo or one of these incredible blackwater habitats. It's like a little, you know, you can stare at your tank and just imagine yourself right there. I, I'm next thing you know, I'll be in a dugout canoe in my living room. So, exactly. All right. So my tank is set up right now for about six weeks, and I just spent a little bit of time just before Mike and I are standing here picking his brain about what to expect next in that aquarium. Sure. I mean, it's all part of the process, and that's a big part of going in that real natural direction of, okay, we're going to use natural materials in the tank, and you're gonna get some stuff, you know? You're gonna get biofilm, algal films, you're gonna get all kinds of interesting bacteria that are actually breaking down the materials on those leaves, on the seed pods. But that's what a lot of fish not only live in in the wild, but feed on. So uh, that's actually a useful food source for tons of fish. If you look at gut content studies of a lot of Amazonian fish, the majority of what they're eating is biofilm. It's, it's this, just material made of, of bacteria, discarded uh, material, fungal material, all kinds of interesting little things. And sometimes they pick up little crustaceans and worms in the mix. So fish are, you know, if your checkerboards, I see them cruising around in the tank with that downward pointing mouth. They pick at that. And, and in the wild, that's a big part of their diet is just grazing on that biofilm. There's a natural process there. And the biofilm will clear up over time. Uh, basically, it's like an al algal bloom in a marine tank. You know, you always end up getting one when you're cycling a new marine tank because there's nutrients that those algae are taking advantage of, and you get the same thing in freshwater natural tanks. So, there's nutrients, there's there's material that that bacteria is eating, and once that material's eaten up, you don't see the biofilm anymore. But you will start to see deterioration of the leaves, and they fall into pieces, kind of create a a layer of uh, detritus or mulm on the bottom of the tank. Um, but that's, you know, people get a little freaked out about that and I don't blame them. It's, it's so antithetic, you know, it's, it's the antithesis of what we're expecting in a clean freshwater tank. So it's a little nerve wracking, but you can, you can embrace it, you know? And, um, basically, I've been dealing with that as my tanks evolve in age too. I find that um, a good gravel vac and just hover the siphon over the bottom of the tank and any of the lighter material will just get sucked right up into it. And then you can leave some of the bigger particles and particulate matter, but that helps clean some of that. I don't, I don't do too much intensive uh, cleaning of the, the natural tanks, you know, but you will, you will find that the filter needs to get changed more often. Um, the mechanical filtration will get clogged up with that stuff pretty easily. So you do need to keep an eye on that sort of thing. But it's harmless to the fish, you know? As long as your water quality is in line, you're not seeing nitrates, 
The fish are quite happy. <laughs> as long as your tank's not tremendously overlit, you shouldn't see algal blooms or anything like that. Um, you do your regular water changes, your nitrates should stay in line, but I've never seen, and I've had some densely populated tanks with a real lot of muck on the bottom that I've never seen any kind of problems with uh, pollution. Yeah. For Tetris, there's a world of different options there. Um, I would recommend even maybe trying some pencil fish in there if you get a chance. I love pencil fish. And the, the Equus pencil fish, the dip tail, it's been a fish that's been in the hobby for decades, you know, but it's totally underappreciated and they actually really shine the most in a tannic aquarium that's more natural. Those fish you find in the wild in the extreme shallows, just like that video we did where I'm, you know, diving through that very shallow water, there's Equus pencil fish all over the place there. So that's a neat one to, the, to add interest to the top levels of the water. Um, if you want something that's a medium-sized cichlid, that could add interest there. The um, the festivum is another fish that's been around forever, and you know everybody knows it. But that's a fish that's really gorgeous and totally underappreciated, in my opinion. The ones you often see aren't super happy. You know, in pet stores, they're not always colored up as best as they could be. But the ones I've kept in in tannic aquariums, in particular, they fire up yellow. They've got some beautiful turquoise highlights on the face, and they add interest to the middle and top levels of the tank for sure. Hatchets are great, definitely. Marble hatchets will be right at home in your setup. They're a blackwater fish naturally. They're found in the same habitat as cardinal tetras and checkerboard cichlids, so they'll be right at home there for sure. Just make sure you have a lid on that tank because they will jump. Bleeding hearts are terrific, yeah. And there's actually, if you can source them, there's a really pretty species of bleeding heart that you don't see in the trade too much. Uh, it's called the flameback bleeding heart. And that species is actually, it's from the Rio Negro, one of the tributaries, and they just have a lot more vibrant color with an almost iridescent pink stripe along the back. So that one, if you can find it, they're a little tricky to, to locate, but man, that's a beautiful fish. Uh, angels are great for a while, but you know, at a larger size, they can terrorize a, a, even a medium-sized tank. You know, Their cichlid nature emerges as they get bigger. So you end up having disappearing small fish. They get aggressive, they get territorial. Um, uh, angels I prefer to have in a, in a bigger setup if possible. One more thing I'd recommend too, you said you're dealing with biofilm right now. Uh, one of my all-time favorite biofilm eaters when I have driftwood that has that cottony stuff on it or, or that kind of slick stuff growing on the outside, Farloellus, the stick catfish. Again, a fish that's been around for years, very inexpensive, very easy. That fish is by far my favorite um, to eat that biofilm and they'll be quite happy with it. Uh, they clear it up right away and they're also just fun to have in the tank. Mine are really, they're just, I, I see them all the time. They're not hiding like uh, some of the other algae eaters would, so they're fun. Sure, quarries are terrific in that sort of environment. Even though you probably wouldn't see them in the wild in too much of a Igarape or Igapoke habitat, that flooded forest, they like more moving water, but um, there's certainly plenty of Corydoras, like pygmy quarries would be quite happy there. Um, even uh, there's a few nice species out of the Rio Negro that would be right at home there, but most quarries would be very happy in that environment. You know, you figure those fish have that, they have their, um, their barbells there on the front of their face for a reason, and that reason is they're rooting around in the substrate looking for food. They'll help keep the bottom of your tank from piling up too much detritus so that they'll have a little active role in the tank too. I wanted to ask Mike, I noticed in some of the pictures that you posted there was a little yellow dwarf cichlid. What was that? Uh, sure, that was a Bioticus opercularis, which you know unfortunately doesn't have a better name than that. But it's a neat little dwarf cichlid. It's not really yellow, although it shows up in the pictures. It's more of a silver with some brilliance in the fins. But as it gets bigger, it's a real pretty fish. And that's a dwarf cichlid you just don't see too often in the hobby, but it's pretty common in the wild. Uh, they're usually found in sandy stretches of river, and they live throughout the Rio Negro, the Tapajos, and several other big tributaries of the Amazon. But it's a neat little dwarf cichlid that could deserve more love in the hobby, for sure. You say it's kind of expensive and kind of hard to keep, though, right? Uh, hard to keep, not necessarily, after they've been established. A lot of the problem with them comes with the fact they don't ship very well. So it's a tricky fish to ship once they've settled in and, and done their thing. They're usually pretty good, but um, you know, they can be a challenge to feed because they have very small mouths and they can't accept, uh, they typically won't accept a lot of prepared foods right away. So 
it's a little bit more of an advanced hobbyist type of fish, but very pretty nonetheless. Anyway, Mike, I want to thank you again for Thanks, for, for coming by and for all the advice. And so we'll continue to watch the uh, uh, this tan and aquarium that I've set up evolve. The checkerboard cichlids are doing great. And the pistogramas are doing great. And I'm really uh, loving this project for the reasons that Mike stated. So uh, go back by all means and look at the other previous ones in this uh, previous FinCast in this series because we set the whole tank up and, and using Mike's advice, I've, I've got all kinds of stuff from Tannin Aquatics in there and we showed you the whole process. So if you're just now getting up to speed on this, you can, you can go back and check it out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next FinCast.